Welcome to the Social Engineer Podcast. This is episode 210 of the Human Element Series. I'm Chris Hadnagy, CEO and founder of Social Engineer LLC, the Innocent Lives Foundation, and the Institute for Social Engineering. And I've been hosting this podcast since way back in 2009. We actually started with this series, so I'm really excited about this episode. A few things, just as some uh, opening reminders. If you're looking for uh, social engineering training, we know it's a big topic we get a lot of questions on. You should check out our brand new website, uh, which will be up and live when this podcast comes out. But we have a whole new training path that will be mirroring the Institute for Social Engineering. We'll be talking about in upcoming episodes. But you can start off with the foundational application of social engineering class. There's two of them, one in Orlando in July and one in Bucharest, Romania in September. Uh, and there may be some more dates coming up there. Then we have the practical application of social engineering. That's a virtual class for the first time in June. And then we have the master's level social engineering class. That's invite only. So if you haven't got your invite and you've been through other classes, please email me and let me know because we have one. We have some openings in that one. And we're working on a brand new class called the psychology of social engineering that Dr. Morano is working on. So that will be coming up really soon. So check out the website for anything that you're interested in there. And if you have any questions, feel free to email in. And if you like the topic of social engineering and want to talk about it, we have a Slack channel. And if you're not a part of it, you can see the link in the show notes, or you can hit me up on Twitter or LinkedIn or any other social media, and I'll get you the link. Uh, but we have over 1,500 people in there now every day talking about the psychology of social engineering. Um, some people who are in the in the practice in the field, they come in to get help on their pretexts. We even have a group that gets together uh, every couple of months and they do some practice sessions so they can uh, get keep their skills up to par. So if you want to join that, you can hit the link in the show notes and join us over there on our social engineering Slack channel. Just as a reminder, it's a family friendly channel and we keep everything above board and legal. So if that's not your style, go find another place because we, we really don't want that kind of uh, conversation in there. But come on over if you are family friendly and you want to learn. That's the best place that you can be with uh, with us there. Okay, a couple other things uh, before we start with our awesome guest. If you are listening to this podcast, I invite you to go check out InnocentLivesFoundation.org. If you're not familiar with our mission over there, uh, we started that about five and a half years ago, and our team works very hard with law enforcement around the globe to geolocate people who are trafficking children and creating child abuse material. We've now done almost 500 cases that we've worked with law enforcement and turned them in. Actually, we worked a lot more. Those 500 cases that uh, we're close to are the ones that have, have been turned into law enforcement. We're a nonprofit organization that is not a vigilante group. So if you want to support us, you can join our team if you have the skills, the talent, and you, the desire to do that, or you can help us out through donating uh, all on the website, innocentlivesfoundation.org. And if you're a caregiver or a parent and you're looking for information on how to talk to your kids about these problems, then you can find that information on the website too. So please uh, check that out. And, um, and give us some support there. And last but not least, if you're loving the music in this podcast, then you must love the band Clutch, the best rock and roll band on the planet Earth. Of course, you know, I'm a huge fan and I've been a huge fan my whole life. Um, but now you, you have to, another reason to be a huge fan because Neil and the band are huge supporters of the ILF. And if you go to their Spotify and you see a little donate button, that goes all the way to ILF. So we love them. You love them. The music is awesome. And give them a big shout out. Go to pro-rock.com. Check out their tour, buy their merch, get some new albums, and uh, and just tell Neil what a great guy he is and the rest of the band, too. Okay, let's talk about our great topic today. I'm really excited about this. So I know we've spoken about escape rooms on other podcasts and other um, episodes of the podcast. You know that I'm a fan of them. I've talked about my family and I doing them for fun. Well, we have with us today, Tommy Houghton. And he's a writer and experienced designer specializing in intersection of interactivity and narrative. He's produced work around the world for audiences of all sizes and regularly lectures about design. He is also the co-creator of the award-winning escape room Stash House. And we're going to talk all about how the things that we do in SE blend perfectly with the thoughts and processes of escape rooms and also all those other things about design, which is going to be fascinating. Tommy, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me on. So let's start off with the, the question I always like to ask in the beginning. How did you get here? How did you get to doing this as your career? It definitely wasn't a direct route because I grew up loving scavenger hunts and mystery stories. My dad was a huge Sherlock Holmes fan. So I grew up with sort of all these disparate feelings about like video games and scavenger hunts and all that. And when I was a kid, I found a scavenger hunt in the park across the street uh, with my sister and we sort of followed it. And kind of what was better than finishing it was it went to a location we knew where it was, but it was too far away. 
So we did the next logical thing was we went back home and made one for our friends. <laughs> I will never know who uh, did the one in the park, but the mystery was always there as a kid. So I, I went to college, studied psychology. Uh, I then went into film and TV and I, I felt something was missing. The entertainment industry at large just didn't resonate with me in the way I was hoping. I still loved telling stories. Uh, I still loved entertaining people. But then suddenly uh, you see immersive interactive entertainment like escape rooms pop up. And that was just like the thing that I've been missing my whole life. I mean, this is the thing that I'm excited about. So yeah, I jumped into it and haven't looked back since. It's been a sort of an incredible ride that I think young me would not believe me if I said I get to do this for a living. You know, I love that answer because I, I say that all the time too. If someone had told me that, hey, Chris, when when you're in your 30s, 40s, what are you going to be doing for your life? I'd have been like, I don't know what you're talking about, right? Uh, that sounds like a one-way ticket to prison. But um, I, I love that. You know, when when I was growing up, because I remember like when video games just came out, that tells you how old I am. I remember the first Atari system, right? We had that. But before that, I loved those choose-your-own-adventure books. Like you're mm -hmm. reading the book and if you want this ending, if you choose to go right on this path, jump to page 42. I would read those books like and then choose different paths every time just to figure out like how the, the book went. Um, what's the reason why like like so, you know, you said this, the entertainment industry kind of stepped away from that. It seems like we got very almost bland. But why do people love that kind of stuff so much? I think the idea of agency is a very powerful driver. Uh, the idea that you are in control of a story or character, uh, I think there's a lot of psychological reasons, especially today, why it's even more resonant. But I think there's something about you being the hero of your journey. Mm -hmm. You know, growing up with, I grew up with those two. Like I checked those out from the library. There's an odd one, an Indiana Jones one that R.L. Stein wrote. Uh, and I would get them and I would mark them with post-its <laughs> and I would then try to figure out how I could beat the entire book by finding every ending. Wow. And, and the, but the idea was, yeah, the, the, the book was a puzzle to crack and it was me finding the answers. And I think that's how people like to sort of feel about control over a story or an experience. Video games have done a very good job of crafting this journey that you start on that you're able to finish. And there's something about you being in charge of a narrative. Now, uh, not to say that every narrative should be that way. There are amazing filmmakers and writers and people who you're happy to surrender control to mm. and let them take you on a journey. But there is something to be said about the idea of control. How many people in our lives feel like we are able to do everything we want to do? You know, how many people are able to be able to save the day or go off and have these adrenaline fueled adventures when you have a family or are stuck on a job you don't like. So the idea of surrendering control to a boss or a career or just the whims of life can be really uh, fixed for a couple of hours or, you know, 20 minutes by surrendering yourself to an experience where you're in charge and you get to make the choices and you get the adrenaline and dopamine hits. There's just something really renewing about that and sort of reminding you that, yeah, you are in charge. You can make choices. And, and having an experience that reflects that and rewards you for that just it triggers all these things that we don't get to feel all the time. You know, I love that because there are times like where, you know, I'm sitting there with the family. I just want brainless entertainment that doesn't require yeah. thought, right? You know, the, you had a long week or something and you just want to laugh and I don't need to have a thriller or have to figure something out of the whodunit. But then there's days like, I don't know if you watch it, that Black Mirror episode that was really, I thought, revolutionary for TV. Like you choose your own path and you get to click on what you want. And the ending changed every time. Sometimes you want something that is cre ha makes you think really hard right. for, you know, for that entertainment. And I, I think that understanding uh, for you, I would imagine, I'm going to ask this as a question, understanding the psychology of how that works must be an important part of your job. Do you tend to use that education you got in psychology and developing and designing the things that you've designed? Oh. 100%. I think going into it, you know, it's easy to say, oh, making, uh, you know, if you're making an immersive interactive experience. So the, the challenge of, an, you know, what we call like contained media, um, book, hmm. film, something where you under even a play, like you understand when you go to a theater, you sit in the seat, the curtain opens, a play happens, you you're not confused, you, you know, those are players performing on stage. And you know how to consume it. You look at the stage and the curtain closes and you go home and you talk about the show. A movie, you watch it in order. A book, you read from page one to, you know, the end. There's no confusion about how to consume the content. With anything that has an element of interactivity that is not a linear, straightforward path A to B to C to D, there is confusion about how to move around the space. 
And you have to think about how narrative is conveyed. You know, if you read a really well-constructed mystery novel, you know the clues are being, you know, slowly revealed in order for a reason. You know who the characters are because they've been introduced. But if you read a mystery novel in random order, you will be confused because that's not the intended way to solve it or to read it. So with interactive content that allows you to choose where to move around the space, that has a sense of how do you make a thing that makes sense if people can go anywhere they want Mm. and find anything in any order. So that's the real trick of using psychology of, okay, how do we make sure if people are walking around this room, they go over here first? And you don't want them to feel directed. So you don't want to make it a voice going, go over there. (laughs) You have to make them feel like they are compelled to go and start somewhere, even though you don't want to put a giant start here sign or a giant message saying start here. You have to make people feel smart. So it's like a breadcrumbing or they call it signposting where you have these different things that are almost invisible because you people don't like feeling dumb or overly directed. They want to feel smart, but you kind of have to create a space that does direct them invisibly to make the choices you need them to make. And then the hope that if you provide sort of enough spaces for them to start piecing it together, that, you know, you have, let's say in a room, you want four areas that they could start it, you know, whether it's finding a letter or an object or a thing that's going to help kick off what they need to look for, you will better light those areas. People can't even tell you why, but they will go to better lit areas than shadowy ones. If you have something glowing or something that is in particular bright, you know, video games and cartoons have been doing this for ages, you know, where... You know, you could watch an old Scooby-Doo cartoon and you could tell an object they were going to grab because it was the brightest one because that's the rest of the frames are these matte paintings and they painted one cell. And it's like, you can do that in real life by making something pop and people are going to walk over and go, oh, well, clearly I should look at this. So it's really about designing a space where people don't realize they're being directed. And that's where a lot of psychology comes into play of, okay, how do people also communicate? Because you're not designing something for one person. You're designing things for people to talk together. And, and that's really tricky. People tend to not like sharing things if they feel scared of looking dumb or the risk of looking bad in front of their group. So you have to find ways to sort of break the ice and create sort of early easy wins to build confidence so they will keep doing that. So there's a lot of structural stuff you really want to build because, you know, to me, testing is very valuable to learn all this. And that's also a huge part of psychology because Testing is valuable, but not because of what people tell you afterwards. It's what they do. You know, as you know, when people uh, do anything, they bleed data everywhere, why they click, where they move. And if you start watching where people navigate a room or what they do, and then you ask them why they did it, they're terrible at telling you why. You know, we're, we're brain, our brains are black boxes that like to fabulate why we, uh, or confabulate why we do what we do. <laughs> and, you know, if I say, why did you go over to that corner first? someone might come with an answer and that might not be right. Because what I found, for example, in an early game I was working on, there was an area that people avoided. And I would ask, so you went over here, here, and here, and you went to this place last. And it happened to be the darkest area of the room. And no one could say why. They would say, oh, it didn't look interesting, or oh, those other areas were interesting. As soon as we lit the area better, it became the first place people went. Hmm. No one ever articulated because it was dark. Yeah. So the idea of being able to be aware of what motivates us as humans tends to be rather predictable, but you have to sort of mix the data of what are they doing and combining it with how the space is laid out and starting to combine and build your own aha moments. Oh, so if I put a light here, people will go over here first and then be more satisfied by finding something naturally rather than being told or directed. So it's a lot of that, trying to figure out how do you give people the biggest sense of intelligence and brain boosting because, you know, they're feeling smart and connecting the dots without being specifically told to go in this order. So, yeah, it's, it's a tricky, but it's really fun. That's the part that's most exciting is when people get energized, you feel it. And I'm sure when you play games with your family, you feel the same thing, that, that kick of adrenaline and dopamine you get from working together as a team, overcoming obstacles. And then at the end, you have this buzz of like, we did it. Let's do another one. Yeah. I'm I'm thinking, as you were saying, I didn't even realize what was happening, but I'm thinking about the last one that we did as a family and that, you know, you, you had like 60 minutes. So you already have this timer that's counting down. So you have that, that stress. And when we got put in the room, you know, you get put in this really dark room and then it lights up when the timer starts and it was tiny. And I'm like, wait, this can't be where we're at for 60 minutes. So I right away said, there has to be a fake wall. There has to be something we got to do. It's going to open up to the bigger room because there's no way we're here for 60 minutes. But there was this, like LED lights on the top that were 
going towards this payphone. And I don't, I didn't think of it until you just said it. That was directing me. Like they were, they were kind of like beep, 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 beep. And it was going towards the payphone, like a, like a electrical signal. Right. And I'm like, yeah, that's why I went there. <laughs> I went there because that light was saying like, Oh, this must be important because all the electrical signals leading to this payphone. And that's how we, you know, and then we found a, um, like some graffiti and, and it said, call this number for something. And then we dialed the number and the wall opens up. Right. And I'm like, yeah, but it was like, there were dark and dingy areas all over the place that we didn't look at. And we went to where it was well lit and where we had this electrical signal saying, you better go here. And that's fascinating to think like that was that was a design thing where I thought, well, mm-hmm. we're all geniuses. We figured that out really fast. But it wasn't. It was designed. So we did figure it out really fast, which is kind of fascinating. Yeah. I mean, that's the idea is that you want people to feel smart and connected yeah. and observant. And th- that, those moments work. The other thing that's interesting is that narratively, if you want to tell more of a narrative story, because games and experiences all range around are, are they puzzle heavy or is it narrative heavy? Is it something in between? Every game is different and, and a lot of designers or people in this immersive interactive landscape, whether you're building a theme park that just has cool thrill rides or you're making more of a story experience. The idea of how you tell a story in a non-traditional space is challenging because let's say, you know, you have a big emotional reveal at the end of a film or end of a book. And you're, you're going to be sobbing at the end if you know the story. But if I tell you that right now and you don't know the characters and I'm like, okay, so this happens. And you're like, wait, who's that? How does that right. happen? The ending doesn't matter if you don't know the context. So oftentimes the blocks or gated areas or physical, you know, blocking that you unlock, the idea is those locks or that area sort of helps tell the story in order where if you make the information you need to understand the story, get you to the second act and third act. And that sort of is a way to guarantee that you know the emotional journey of the story so that by the end of it, you do know it. Even if it's you learning it in, let's say there are three parts you have to learn, you can learn them in any order. But once you learn all three of those, then you can go to the next part. It's a way of also gatekeeping story Mm -hmm. and having a progression that, again, gives you some sense of control. Because if you just made it free open, you could find the ending at the beginning. It wouldn't have that emotional impact. That's how humans work is needing to learn in some sort of informational order. So, you know, I know like Kaleidoscope, the show on Netflix that let you watch the series in any order. You know, it's a clever yeah. experiment, but, you know, it, it, human beings do need to have some element of, of hierarchy in which information is, is ordered to be able to fully understand and appreciate the ending. So yeah. that's the interesting part of like designing and testing stuff out because for every rule or every idea I just said, there's ways to counteract that and use it in a satisfying way. It just takes understanding people trying it out and then watching the result. And then, you know, a lot of these little experiments work. And that's, that's to me is why I love the testing aspect so much because you build something and I want to get in front of people as quickly as possible because I have assumptions. Uh, I have assumptions about what I think will work. And, you know, I might be completely off because, you know, I'll test it out and people do the opposite of what I did, what I designed. <laughs> and I'm like, good, glad I caught it. <laughs> but what I love doing is it, it's sort of like in D and D, you know, basically, you know, you might have a, a DM who is designing a really big campaign. It was like, okay, my players are going to go down this road and find this huge thing. And then the players decide to go left. <laughs> and you're like, well, I guess we're improvising this time. You just, you can never anticipate what people are going to be doing. And one of my favorite bits is, you know, I'll design this big, crazy thing. And I'll put it in front of people for the first time and I'll have them go in and they'll come up with something completely different. And I'm like, wow, I didn't think of that, but I love it. Let's do it. And they go, did you intend to design it that way? I'm like, no, but now I did yeah. because you, you find like, it's like the idea of carving out a channel to pour water. And you think you know where the water is going to go. And then you pour it, it goes somewhere else. Right. And I'm like, well, let's follow that. Cause you want to follow what human beings instinctually want to do. And, and you realize that maybe there's something about the space or the area of the story that you're building that you're communicating invisibly that you're not realizing that you didn't intend to put out. But you, in my mind, like you naturally want to go towards the grain of how people want to engage with your material. And if, if you're not engaging correctly, you can either try to change the water or just flow with it. And that's what I like doing is sort of flowing and seeing, Oh, I didn't think of it that way, but you could easily do this and adjust this. So I love that tinkering moment of, it, I built something, but people are allowing me to change it in different ways. Can you give me like a story of maybe the most fascinating time where you de- you developed a escape room or a game or something, and you you intended it for, like you said to go right, but then everyone went left, and it ended up being the best thing. 
Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of examples. I, the one that really comes up to mind early on when I was building the very first game uh, in Los Angeles that I built, Stash House, uh, there was a puzzle that I was really proud of. And it basically involved you looking at two bits of information and combining it to look at a third place. People would find half the information in one spot, <laughs> half the information elsewhere. And it was basically a grid of info. So you'd find a grid that was basically, it was a, imagine like a series of boxes and you would get the top half of the boxes in one spot and the bottom half in another spot. Now the top half was easy to find. People would find that within probably 30 seconds. The bottom half they would find later. It was well hidden. It was inside of a closet. And that was something usually they'd find later. Mm -hmm. Now visually it was very clear they went together. <laughs> However, the thing that I didn't think of was that you, I knew there were two parts, but they didn't. So mm -hmm. what they would do is they would find the top half easily and they would stare at it for a while thinking, Oh, I have enough information hmm. to solve, but they couldn't, they were missing the bottom half. They just didn't know they needed it. And so what they do is they stare at that for a while and they couldn't do anything with it. And so eventually they'd give up and eventually they'd find the bottom half and they were like, Oh yeah, okay. It, it connects. But they were always, there was always a frustrated energy about actually solving it. And I'm like, God, and they would always say, this is the worst one by far in the game the, remove it. And I was like, you know, there's something up. I, I you know, I, I will listen if they, if it's the lowest rated thing, I'll take it out. But there's something about the way they are finding it. They're not finding both parts. They're sitting at one, staring at it until they're frustrated. And then that frustration applies to the entire thing. So how can I visually communicate to them that, that they're missing something without writing like one of two and being really direct? And I'm like, wait. What if I change the way the information is cut in half? Originally, it's boxes and there's like a invisible line and you don't see that anything's cut in half. But visually, you know, if something is missing, cut in half visually, you know, something is missing. So I just changed the orientation of the cut. I made it vertical cut, which actually cut all the boxes in the middle in half. So you're, you, you visibly see something yeah. is missing. Yeah. I say same information. Same idea that you're missing half, but what people will do is as soon as I tried that out, people would look at it for a second and then know they were missing something and keep looking. And it went from being the lowest rated puzzle to the highest rated. Wow. Just from changing so, the direction of the cut. Yeah, because it, it, it communicated you're missing something. Don't spend time on this. And this is the thing is people were not able to articulate why they didn't like it. They yeah. were mad yeah. that they'd spent time and were mad at me for, but they couldn't articulate the idea that that invested frustration was yielding difficulty and anger at the whole puzzle. And, and it, they, they, how do you know that if you'd done something early, you'd have liked something more? It's hard to wrap your head around that. Instead, you just attribute it to the puzzle's bad rather than here's some ways to fix it. And so I was really happy that once we just changed that, it, 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 people don't have that sunk cost of staring at this thing and getting mad. You do, you know, okay, we're missing something and you go now actively more on the hunt for where the other half is. And then when you find the other half, you get the brain tickles for finding it. And yeah, it, yeah, it was just interesting because had I, had I listened to their uh, actions or their, sorry, their, uh, their words, I would have cut it. But by yeah. following the thread of what they were doing and trying something different, I was really, really proud of that. Yeah. What a great story. I mean, that, that is really awesome. There's something so simple too. Like when you were saying it, I started thinking, okay, did you put like a note there that's saying need second half or did you put a, you know, missing B or yeah. something like, but just changing the direction of the cut. That is really a fascinating piece of, of, of psychology really to, to make them it, think it, through that. And it shows, and it shows you that user behavior is crucial to follow. And, and it's, you know, what people tell you is a very small part of, yeah. of what actually is happening. And so to me, it's like, that was a big lesson in anytime I design anything, I need to see and watch people when testing. And I need to like, that to me is such a visual part of, of, of the data of knowing where is that note coming from? Because if you just listen, you're, you're leaving behind so much valuable information and you may be cutting stuff out that could easily be fixed to, you know, that will actually work. But, you know, if you just listen to what they say, you might be cutting out tons of stuff that's like, you know, it's like removing a, you know, diseased tissue. It might be just a tiny cut or a switch, but instead people just throw the everything out instead of doing a small cut or revision. So that to me was a big lesson. And gosh, how much work would I be throwing at otherwise if I didn't watch this? Yeah. 
do you think now because you know all this and and that you you know this is what you do that when you go to an escape room do you find yourself like going to the darkest areas because you say well that's not where normal normally people would go or do you find yourself kind of circumventing all these things because <laughs> you know that's probably where they put the clue it's it, I, I I'm very careful in that I can turn off my designer brain really easily and I I always say that if I can't play as a normal player then I'm lost as a designer so it's very much like you know I, I met the filmmaker Harold Ramis many years ago and he saw he sat to, I, there was a screening and I, he was there the whole time and afterwards I said is it weird to sit and watch this thing that you spent like two years of your life on, what do you see when you watch the screen? And he's like, I see every shot, every circumstance. He's like, yeah, I can't dis- disassociate it from yeah. the thing. And I, I was thinking, gosh, I, if I, you know, if I can't turn off that part of my brain, I get it when it's something personally you've worked on. But for me, it's like when I go into any experience, I have to be able to turn off that side. Because to me, it's like that enjoyment factor is right. sort of the thing that I'm chasing because I want to design for people in the way, like I'm an in of one. I, I know it's not a scientifically, you know, uh, or mathematically significant number. I'm one person, but I sort of use that as a basis for if this gets me excited or I love the concept, then I think it's going to translate to something, mm-hmm. you know, and even though I know it is, is, is something that appeals to me and I'm, I'm, one person with a particular set of tastes. But, you know, if I, if I can't go have all these experiences and experience them organically like a real person, then, then my design aesthetics and my antenna and my ability to triangulate everything is stuck. And I, every great designer I know is of the same milk mm-hmm. that they have to be able to turn that off because otherwise you're just sort of lost like an alien, you know, examining things without being able to appreciate them from what mm-hmm. they are. You know, it's like I, I, you know, going to a restaurant that's supposed to have great food and just staring at the food and like looking at the magnifying glass and not actually eating it. Yeah. And that's to me, it's like, I want to eat the food. And then afterwards we can break down and have that other view of like, okay, let's change perspectives. You know, where the designer in me is always in the back of my head writing down notes, but I can tune that out. And then at the end we go and get a drink and we talk about the experience and then I can pull out the designer mm-hmm. side. But that's important to me because, you know, it, but that being said, being an experience is, yeah, you can jump ahead. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes it's good or bad. Sometimes there are designers who do things kind of in different order and you try something and you get ahead of yourself because you kind of expect this is going to be a hidden door. And, well, I see the maglock strip there and this is clearly an RFID reader. And, you know, you kind of jump ahead. And sometimes that's not your own peril where yeah. you make assumptions and it's, you just need to surrender to be like, no, no, okay. trust the designer. Really good designers will, will lead you and clue you well. Uh, but sometimes bad designers or bad experiences, you might just be like, well, uh, I don't want to ask for a hint. I think this is going to open here. Let's just put these three things here and remix them until it opens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I get that. That's actually really fascinating. I think I'm more like your director friend where I have a hard time shutting it off. Um, but I do enjoy the experience. Like I enjoy going in and getting duped or tricked or having to struggle and, getting right to the wire where it's like 59 minutes and we're just, there's one more clue and we have to solve it. You know, I, I love that part because it's uh, to me, the, the adrenaline is the exciting part of, of doing all of that. Yeah. Same for me. It's like, I, you know, the old joke of like, I'm not just the president of hair club for men. I'm also a member. Like that's for me. It's like, yes, I not, I don't, I don't, don't just design this, but I also play this and I would rank myself as a player or a consumer of this content more important than a designer. Because if I don't know what it feels like to pay for these experiences and to make sure that people get the best possible experience or whatever it is I'm designing or doing, you know, you, you tune out the fact that you're making a good product that entertains people, that connects people, that gives people, you know, frights or, you know, a family a chance to connect. And if you lose that, to me, you lose part of what makes being a good designer is that grounding. And so that's why I just, I always see that being so crucial as, you know, if I lose that sense and I lose what makes me a good designer and business person. That's, that's cool. So what are you working on now? Like what's your, what's your next project? What, what's, what's happening in your life? Yeah, it's a, it's, I'm very lucky in that I, you know, started with escape rooms, but also was very involved in immersive theater and interactive entertainment. So that's everything from video games and AR, VR experiences to theme entertainment um, and everything in between. So I've worked on a number of escape room projects all over the world, but I've also worked on marketing activations, these big sort of immersive scale uh, things that, you know, a lot of companies now everywhere from Disney to Amazon and Netflix build these things to promote their shows or brands 
in a way that's more than just casually looking at something, but rather making you part of the story. Mm -hmm. So I played a small part in the Stranger Things experience that's running across the US and is now about to go to Canada and Europe. And that's, you know, using characters from the show with some of the actors, uh, the Duffer brothers who created the show were involved in some of the stories. So it's in canon and it's a live walkthrough experience that puts you in the middle of the action. And so the chance to play with IP is really exciting because you have fandoms that love these worlds and giving them the chance to actually step into the world and go into the upside down. And, you know, if you're a Stranger Things fan. Yeah. Uh, but I love playing with IP that, especially stuff that I really connect with because there's something about, you know, I love doing small, indie, weird, original projects too. But there's something about being able to entertain people when you've always been a fan of something to step into it. There's something just really, really palpable about that. So brands and companies are realizing the value of that. So I've worked on a ton of those sort of IP experiences for a lot of clients and companies. So uh, I'm headed to Mexico soon to go work on the money heist experience that I worked on for Netflix. Uh, so that opens uh, and in, in uh, about a month. So yeah, I've been working on that with a buddy of mine for the past year, uh, sort of getting that ready and taking the world of money heist and putting that into an experience that again can create a sense of being in the world of the show. So I, I, I'm a Stranger fans, I'm a Stranger Things fan, but I don't, I never heard of this. So is it like a VR or is it like a physical thing or? No, it's physical live action. You can go through. Wow. It's uh, the 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 premise is that uh, there is a uh, experiment being run in the Hawkins lab and you are invited to participate. And then of course, everything goes perfectly fine. <laughs> Nothing bad happens and yes. everything goes as expected. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, it's a, it's a walkthrough experience that takes you uh, and puts you face to face with, you know, everything you'd expect from the series, you get action adventure, you get some twists and turns, you get to see some of your favorite characters. Uh, and again, it's the chance to really put you in the the driver's seat when it comes to how you engage with the space. And that to me is really exciting. Yeah. That, and that's a, what a, and you were right. What a great idea for marketing because it's, it takes, it takes it now out of the television. You become mm -hmm. part of the story in the show, which is something most fans would never ever get a chance to do. So it's going to really, uh, and if you, if you, any, any show you're doing that for, it's going to really endear you to that, to that show. That's really interesting. Yeah. It's fun. Like I, I like the challenge because oftentimes with marketing teams, they'll say, cause escape rooms have become really big. You know, it's the point where it used to be, what's that? And it's, you know, local news, you yep. know, getting paid to be locked in a room, you know, yeah. that, that kind of thing. It, but now escape rooms are less novelty and people now know what they are. And most major markets have them, even small markets have them. You know, uh, they took a hit during lockdown and COVID, but they, you know, the, it's picked back up. I think people especially missed in-person events that you could sort of go and do with people and, and this tactile, tangible, kind of experiences were really valuable, you know, getting out of lockdown and getting into, you know, people connecting again in person. And marketing companies now know escape rooms. And they'll use that term very openly when they really mean they want something people can do that's narratively driven with some kind of puzzle or solving stuff, even if it's not in a room. So uh, it's my job now, usually when I get a phone call, they'll say, okay, we want an escape room for this. And I'll say... I get it. You don't really want that. Here's what you want, you know, because you have to figure out, okay, we might have 30 influencers are going to be doing something for this TV show and we want them to have a great experience or something for this movie. So, you know, how you approach the movie Uncharted or the video game Uncharted is very different than how you'd approach a show like Bosch. You know, Bosch is a very grounded detective uh, story and Uncharted is very much Indiana Jones. And so how do you use a location and a space and a day with influencers to give them the feeling they're in that world hmm. and, you know, putting them in the chance, you know, usually it's like putting them in the role where they get to be Bosch or they get to be Nathan Drake and have these adventures. And so it's like, okay, wh wh what's the story? And then coming up with that narrative with the locations. And then what's the, you know, what's the stuff they're solving? Are they solving a crime? Mm. Are they, you know, stealing a treasure to give it back to a museum? Like, what's the narrative? And then how do you build the pieces of them doing it? And so it's really exciting to break down something. But in my mind, it's like, okay, well, you think of a charter. What do you think of? You think of sneaking. You think of cool locations. Okay. You think of, you know, uh, big, interesting sort of set pieces that are revealed. You think of, you know, all these things. And it's just like, okay, how can we put those into real life? And so I, I see everyone as a challenge, a creative challenge. 
So here in Orlando, like where I live, there is pr- there's dozens of escape rooms. I mean, hundreds. It's like you can, yeah. if you're on iDrive, like where the, all the tourists are, you can't walk 15 feet without another escape room. And all of them have a different experience, right? They're not the same. It's not like all of them are, you know, just, you know, diffuse this bomb or something. Like you could, we, as a family, we could literally choose any one and you're going to have a different experience at every one. And that's what I love about it. So you're right. The market has kind of grown and there's so many here that you, you'll never have to do the same one twice if you, if you don't want to. Yeah, in Orlando, that whole market in Florida is really, really good. You have uh, everything from Clearwater, Kissimmee, Orlando. There are some great companies and great games. A friend of ours uh, just uh, literally was there two days ago playing all the games there. So, you know, it, it's now normal for escape room tourism, for people to travel to really great destinations and play some of the great games. And, and it's just a cool way to experience an area. So even if I'm going somewhere for a project, I will try to find a local room or something wherever I'm going just to just to try out new stuff. I think it's really exciting to try because... There are so many different kinds of designing uh, techniques and styles. And then, you know, looking at the immersive interactive theater scene, you know, it's, it's taking elements of, you know, do you go puzzle? Do you go, how do you go narrative? You, you know, what's the theme? There's so many ways this space is evolving. And, and just, I think the consumer market is getting smarter about, oh, we know what this is. And designers are able to take a little bit more, not risk, but trying things new. Like you said, so it's not always just, you know, the same themes. It's not always just prison. Uh, you know, a jailbreak, uh, a bank robbery, bomb defusal, zombie lab, Egyptian yeah. tomb. You know, you see those over and over again. But the fact that people can tell more interesting kind of stories around, you know, different spaces, that, that to me is really exciting. That is. That's kind of cool. So, Tommy, a lot of um, we always have some questions as we finish up. But uh, uh, all of us, wherever we are, usually there's at least a, one or two people that have helped us get there. Who would you consider your greatest mentors in, in your life or your career? I mean, I owe a lot to anyone that took me seriously uh, when I was trying to transition from film and TV. There is a really amazing dude named Marty Parker uh, out of Ohio, who was kind of the Johnny Appleseed of escape rooms. He uh, was a former you know, investment banker kind of guy who got sick of that rat race and moved his family to Ohio mm-hmm. and invested in escape rooms. So he had often the first room in many markets. And so when I first saw this is something really cool. I reached out to him and he said, yes, he took me seriously. And his validation of my interest in this, I think, again, is why I'm sitting here with you. Because he took me seriously. He took the time to answer questions. He gave me advice. And, you know, I, I, I owe him so much because, yeah, he, early confidence boosting and, and validation is so valuable. So I make sure if anyone ever reaches out to me that I do the same because I know how valuable it is. So Marty was a huge, huge influence. And then more recently, uh, there's a guy named Sean Stewart, who is an amazing novelist and writer who sort of was one of the grandfathers uh, or fathers of ARGs, the alternate reality game style um, sort of online, is it real, is it a game kind of thing that he created. Uh, with a few other folks. And, and Sean has been a dear friend and just a brilliant, brilliant sort of mentor who is also deeply kind. Mm-hmm. And I think for me, everyone who I've seen as a mentor is both really creative and smart, but also incredibly kind and validating. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I wouldn't be here without people like that. That's awesome. That's really, that's really great. And I love that message about taking people seriously. I, I've had a similar journey when I wanted to start this. There was nobody really doing social engineering as a career. And I had a few people that actually sat me down and talked to me and really helped me. And, uh, and I, I said to myself, because of that, whenever someone reaches out and asks, like, how can I get into this? I'm going to make time to meet with them and to talk with them if I feel they're serious. So I just ask a couple questions. And then if I go like, okay, yep, this person's serious, like, let's meet, let's talk. Uh, because you never know what that does for somebody, right? I wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for those people. Yeah. No, I, I respect that a lot. I think there's there's a sense of, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, <laughs> uh, thanks to Spider-Man's uncle. Like, to me, I take that very seriously. Yeah, it, yeah, you never know what a kind word and a 15-minute conversation could do to help someone. And so I, you know, I, I, I try to always make time for that just because, yeah, you never know. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, for 13 years on this podcast, we've asked every guest, um, what, what is their favorite book or what books do, would you recommend? This even be about the topic we spoke about. It could just yeah. be something you read that you loved. What books would you recommend? There are three that I think come to mind that I think really influenced me and they're not game design books at all. They're psychology books, um, or, or two of them are. Uh, one is the book Sex at Dawn. 
And the idea of learning sort of how human beings used to live as nomadic tribes, how sort of as descendants from apes, looking at both chimps and bonobos, and just seeing the idea of like how human beings exist as people with other people was so illuminating to me, you know, that, that it really influenced a lot of how I approach design about, you know, how people interact as groups. And then also uh, the book Sapiens really opened my eyes to, again, human beings existing and designing for them. Mm. And then the other one is uh, a two poo books, uh, Blood, Sweat, and Pixels, and Press Reset, both by an author named Jason Schreier, who's a video game um, and entertainment journalist, sort of talking about the video game and entertainment industry at large, and the idea of what it takes to really create uh, games in a marketplace where you know millions of dollars are thrown around easily, and the idea of how does creativity emerge from those kind of environments, and you know whether it's a solo developer working for ten years on something, or you know a five hundred million dollar project that never comes out because it falls apart. Sort of learning the interior uh, view of how work like that is made was really eye opening as well. That's fascinating. I, actually, um, besides Sapiens, I've not heard of any of those books. So I love when we get recommendations that I've not heard of because I'm, I'm an avid reader. I love to read. So I always, uh, I always look for, for new things to add to my list. So thank you for that. I think you like both. Yeah. I, I breeze through all of them. I, when I, you can tell when I love a book is I just, the hours fly by and <laughs> yeah. all those really just pulled me in. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. It's easy to get lost in a good book. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tom, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show, um, sharing your experiences. Fascinating conversation. It actually, uh, now I'm, I really want to go do an escape room <laughs> with my family again. So I'm going to have to talk to the kids and the wife and see if we can schedule something this weekend because now I'm excited to go try another one. Well, Thank I can you. plug an app called Morty. Uh, Morty.app is the name. I am an advisor on it. It is an escape room discovery app. It's available right now for iOS and at some point will be coming up for Android. But the web app is also accessible over browser if you're Android. But Morty.app, M-O-R-T-Y.app is an escape room discovery app. And what's cool about it is finding escape rooms is hard because if you search Yelp or Google Maps or TripAdvisor, you're rating the company, not individual yeah. games. And that to me is kind of like rating a movie theater to go find a movie. You know, yeah. are you going to go see a movie at a theater that's rated five stars? It's not going to tell you anything about the film you're going to go see. And so this rates games individually by tons of people playing and experiencing it where you can look, is it scary? Is it good for families? And you can see all these metrics and it's the most accurate database of escape rooms in the U.S., and slowly we're rolling out immersive entertainment, theme parks, board games, other stuff you can do. So anything that you rate, uh, you'll basically get recommendations that really uh, hew to what you want. And whether you're planning a weekend with your family or you're traveling somewhere and want to check out if there's a good game there, this is sort of your destination. So I'm really proud of what we've been able to build. And uh, yeah, Morty.app is the name uh, and it's great. That's awesome. I have that open now. I'm going to be definitely using that. So thank you. That's another great recommendation. Yeah, look me up. You can see all the games I've played. Uh, just yeah. look up Tommy on Morty.app and you'll see me in the games. And uh, I always love knowing what people find and discover. That's really cool. If people want to follow you or know more about what you're working on next, what's the best place for them to go? Uh, just TommyHunton.com, uh, T-O-M-M-Y, H-O-N-T-O-N.com. Uh, and I kind of keep my site updated with sort of appearances and new stuff I'm working on. Uh, a lot of the work I do is under NDA, so I'm really bad at... <laughs> revealing it. So uh, thankfully, when something does come out publicly, I can finally talk about it. So yeah, I'll be updating with new stuff soon. But you can always follow me, email me, reach out. I'm pretty accessible. And I love supporting anyone who's curious about the industry or looking to uh, check anything out. I'm always happy to recommend stuff. And for everyone who's watching or listening, we'll have that link in the show notes, as well as all the book recommendations and even a link to that app. If you are interested in checking out escape rooms in your area, Tommy, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. It was a really fascinating uh, episode. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Chris. And everyone that's listening, thank you for joining us and listening. And next month we'll be joined by Dr. David Rauf. He's a researcher and psychologist and doctor. We'll be talking about some really fascinating things. So we'll see you next month. See you.